and welcome to Daily Space. My name is Annie Wilson, and most weekdays, the CosmoQuest team is here putting science into your brain. Today, however, is for Rocket Roundup. Let's get to it, shall we? Our first rocket launch of the week was by SpaceX. On February 4th at 619 UTC, a Falcon 9 with yet another batch of Starlink satellites took off from Slick 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. This was the 18th launch of the version 1.0 satellites. The launch was originally scheduled for late January, but was delayed several days to February 4th due to poor weather at the booster recovery zone. This is nothing new. Falcon 9 launches have been delayed before in favor of booster recovery in the past. Boosters are super expensive, and SpaceX really, really wants to get their money is worth. Speaking of reusing boosters, this launch featured the fifth launch of Booster 1060, just 28 days after its previous launch, which was on January 8th. This is the fastest turnaround yet, beating the previous record of 37 days between Booster 1051's seventh and eighth flights on SXM-7 and Starlink Mission 16. This is excellent progress towards SpaceX's stated goal of a 24-hour turnaround for the Falcon 9. For those of you keeping score at home, Eight minutes after launch, 1060 successfully landed on the drone ship, Of Course I Still Love You. Both of the fairings had previously been flown, and according to SpaceX, one flew on GPS 3SV03 mission, while the other was on SALCOM 1 Bravo, and both were successfully retrieved from the water. Before we get into the payload details, let's check out that launch video. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. And lift off. Vehicle is pitching downrange. Stage 1, chamber pressure is nominal. And it's not a SpaceX launch without a SpaceX landing. And there we can see the lights beginning to illuminate the platform and the waters around. Stage two is under terminal. Stage minutes. one, landing leg deploy. Okay, let's see if we're able to stick this landing. Looks pretty good. There we can see the first stage has landed. This marks the this marks the 74th successful recovery of an orbital class rocket and the fifth recovery for that particular booster that you see there. This was a dedicated mission, so another 60 satellites were added to the mega constellation, bringing the total number of version 1.0 satellites launched to 1023 of a planned 1,440 in the first phase of the constellation. So far, that's roughly 71% of the first shell filled. Those 1,023 satellites do not include satellites from the very first launch in May 2019. SpaceX called those 60 satellites version 0.9. And as of January 2021, only six are still operational. Several version 1.0 satellites have also been deorbited, either intentionally or as a result of losing control and being dragged back into the atmosphere uncontrollably. Jonathan McDowell, an astrophysicist who monitors satellites in orbit in his spare time when he's not working on Chandra, reports that as of late January 2021, 14 version 1.0 satellites have been intentionally deorbited or had their orbit decayed uncontrollably. A further 17 of version 1.0 satellites are not raising their orbits. Future phases of the constellation will lead to a total of over 10 
1,000 spacecraft. The next phase of 1,228 will be inserted between five and 600 kilometers at either 70 or 97.6 degree inclinations. SpaceX has further approval to launch 7,518 additional Starlinks to orbits between 335 and 345 kilometers inc and inclinations of 42, 48, and 53 degrees. SpaceX has asked for, but has not yet received permission for an additional 30 thousand satellites to add to the constellation. These additional shells of Starlink satellites will use V-band transponders, unlike the Ka and Ku transponders of the first 1,440. V-band is a higher frequency than Ka and Ku, which will allow for more bandwidth and greater throughput. It's also an unlicensed band, over most of its frequencies in most countries of the world. And these two things alone have made it a favorite in microwave line of sight communications, particularly for backhaul links where fiber isn't an option to move a lot of data around. Other than highly directional microwave links though, not a lot operates in this band. So there's also not a lot of interference to overcome, which is great for urban areas. However, the reason it's not used much is because the band tends to be heavily absorbed by atmospheric oxygen and is also subject to rain fade, which is absorption by water, like when your satellite TV goes out when it's raining. The oxygen absorption in these cases tends to act like soundproofing, which muffles the signal. This is why it's mostly been used for line of sight, radio links of two kilometers or less. More power can help overcome these losses, but it can get prohibitive. Starlink will benefit from coming more or less straight down through the atmosphere in most cases, rather than at an angle, but it still remains to be seen how well this band will work on the ground. If nothing else, it could easily replace the intra-satellite link laser links <laughs> if those prove to be a technological bridge too far. Even if ground service proves impractical, the band may also still be useful for in-flight data links for aircraft operating at altitude. <sighs> Is your brain full of too much Starlink info yet? Astronomers worry about the sky getting too full of moving points of light, but that's a longer story for another day. We'll be right back with more launches with fewer satellites. Our next launch is a surprise Chinese launch. At 1536 UTC, a Long March 3 Bravo launched from the Xichang launch site carrying the TJSW-6 satellite. TJSW is a Chinese acronym meaning Tongxing Ti Shu Shi Yan Wei Xing, which translates to Communications Technology Test Satellite. According to the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation, TJSW6 will be mainly used for satellite communications, radio and television, data transmission, and other services, and carries out related technical test verifications. Not much else is known about the satellite. Unusual for a Chinese rocket launch campaign, the rocket and spacecraft were transported by rail and road to the launch site because the usual method, an Antonov 124 cargo plane, was grounded due to an engine incident. And even though there's not a lot to share about the mission, I still have launch video. is seeing three spacecraft arriving at Mars that have been en route since July 2020. 
First up is Mizabar Al Amal from the United Arab Emirates. Also called the Hope Probe, it entered Mars' gravitational sphere at 236 UTC on February 5th. Orbital insertion took place on February 9th, with confirmation being received about 1540 UTC. The maneuver involved a breaking burn of around 27 minutes, which consumed roughly 400 kilograms of fuel. HOPE's mission is to observe the Martian atmosphere, looking at how energy moves through all parts of the atmosphere at all times of the day and throughout the Martian year. It will look at things such as dust in the atmosphere, which plays a significant role in the temperature on Mars. HOPE will orbit Mars in a near equatorial orbit between 22,000 and 44,000 kilometers. Mission is being carried out by the Emirates in collaboration with several American institutions who will be mentoring them, including the University of Colorado at Boulder, Arizona State University, and the University of California, Berkeley. The next traveler to arrive at Mars is China's Tianwen-1, which entered Mars orbit around 1201 UTC earlier today, February 10th. Tianwen, which translates to questions of heaven, no, excuse me, questions to heaven, was launched from the Wencheng spaceport on Hainan Island last summer on July 23rd. Its mission has two major goals. The first of which is to, to deliver a six-wheeled rover to a flat plane within the Utopia impact basin just north of Earth, Mars equator. The rover will study the geology of the region at and just below the surface. The other major goal is to study the orb planet from orbit with seven remote sensing instruments. The mission scientists are hoping to get at least 90 souls, that's 90 Martian days of service out of the robot, which looks similar to NASA's Spirit and Opportunity vehicles. The last spacecraft en route to Mars is NASA's Perseverance, which also launched on July 30th last summer. It will land in Gerizo Crater next week on February 18th. Unlike Tianwen-1, which we just discussed, it will not stop in Martian orbit first. It will directly enter the Martian atmosphere from its interplanetary interplanetary trajectory, just like Curiosity and the Mars Exploration Rovers. Perseverance's main mission is to seek signs of ancient life and to collect samples of rock and regolith, that's broken rock and soil, for possible return to Earth. But it's probably safe to say that the most exciting part of this mission is the technology demonstration payload known as Ingenuity. NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter is the first aircraft to be sent to another planet to attempt powered controlled flight. If its experimental flight test program succeeds, the data returned could benefit future explorations of the red planet, including those by astronauts, by adding the aerial dimension, which is not available today. We'll have more information about Percy and Ingenuity after they're safely on the surface of Mars in about a week's time. Good luck and safe travels to all the new arrivals at Mars from the team here at CosmoQuest. We'll be right back. A new segment here on Rocket Roundup is This Week in Rocket History, where, as the name suggests, we'll be covering interesting and or significant rocket launches, which took place roughly around this week in history. Our first historical overview is of the Stardust mission, which launched on February 7th, 1999 from Cape Canaveral in Florida on a Delta II rocket. It went straight into a heliocentric orbit after a 27 minute burn, taking it on a path around the sun for an Earth gravity assist later in 2001. The sample return mission collected dust samples from the coma of comet Vilt 2, also known as 81P Vilt, and returned them to Earth for study in 2006. This was the first ever comet sample return mission. The sample collector used aerogel, a very low density gel-like synthetic material, 
which would then trap and hold in place particles of dust as they flew into the capsule. In 2002, the spacecraft flew by asteroid 5535 and Frank on its way to its primary encounter with comet Vilt 2 in early 2004. The 5535 and Frank encounter was primarily used as an engineering test in preparation for Vilt 2. The encounter with comet Vilt 2 officially began on January 2nd, 2004, even though the sample collector was deployed a week earlier on December 24th. 51 days later, on February 21st, the encounter officially ended. During this time, the spacecraft made several engine burns that took it as close as 237 kilometers to the comet. After the flyby, Stardust performed a maneuver that would allow it to encounter Earth again in early 2006. Since the capsule itself had no propulsion, the spacecraft had to perform a series of maneuvers to send it back to Earth. Stardust needed to get close enough to Earth to release the sample return capsule while missing the atmosphere itself, because only the sample return capsule was designed to survive atmospheric reentry. The capsule landed safely in Utah on January 15th, 2006. After the sample return, the spacecraft went into hibernation in a heliocentric orbit, but still had around 20 kilograms of fuel left. In 2007, the spacecraft's mission was extended and renamed Stardust Next, which is a backronym for New Exploration of Temple One. This new extended mission would perform a flyby of Comet 9P Temple 1, nicknamed the Valentine Comet, as Stardust was to meet it on February 15, 2011. This marked the first time an asteroid had been explored twice, as Temple 1 had already been visited and crashed into by deep impact in 2005. Stardust next got as close as 181 kilometers to Temple 1 and took images to examine the comet and attempted to find deep impacts, well, impacts on the comet. While the impact site was observed, it was barely noticeable in the pictures, which was a bit anticlimactic, but still gave us a lot of insight on the comet's composition. At the time of its operation, it also sent set the record for furthest solar-powered spacecraft, a record which would later be broken by missions like Rosetta and Juno. On the 24th of March 2011, Stardust conducted its last maneuver to burn off the rest of its remaining fuel, which scientists then used to improve their fuel consumption estimation models. The spacecraft then sent its last acknowledgement ping and shut off. And what about the returned samples from the original mission? Well, after the capsule landed and was recovered, it was opened in the lab and inside were found at least a million microscopic samples and also 10 samples larger than 100 micrometers, which is 0.1 of a millimeter, with the largest measuring around one millimeter. Data from the mission was analyzed by a citizen science distributed computing project called Stardust at Home. Several of these citizen scientists were credited in the scientific papers using the data. Some of the more exciting discoveries were the existence of various organic compounds in the samples, traces of liquid water and glycine, which is a building block of organic life. Finding liquid water was a paradigm shifting discovery as comets were thought to never get warm enough to liquefy their water. As one NASA astrobiologist said, it supports the idea that the fundamental building blocks of life are prevalent in space and strengthens the argument that life in the universe may be more common than rare. The capsule now resides in the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC alongside a sample of the aerogel used in the collection. We'll be right back. To wrap things up, here's a running tally of a few space flight statistics for the current year. There are currently five toilets in space, three are installed on the ISS, 
one is on the Crew Dragon, and one is on the Soyuz. There have been 11 total orbital launch attempts so far this year, and 281 satellites have been launched into orbit. I keep track of orbital launches by where they launched from, also known as spaceport. Here's that breakdown. USA 5, China 4, New Zealand 1, Russia 1. Your random space fact for the week comes to us from the Twitter account of the Green Bank Observatory. Conservationists needed to do a study on the migration patterns of endangered flying squirrels in the Monongahela National Forest in West Virginia around the radio telescope. This required the use of GPS transmitters to track the animals, which was a bit of a problem because the Green Bank Telescope is very sensitive to radio missions and is actually in a radio quiet zone. For the three month duration of the study, no data could be taken with the telescope due to interference from the transmitters. So instead, the team performed needed maintenance. For now, this has been The Daily Space. Thank you.